All right, good evening, folks. Let's go ahead and stand with me. Turn to 240 this evening in your hymnal, The Lily of the Valley. Sing it out. Sing it out, The Lily of the Valley. 240. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The Lily of the Valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, Through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Amen. Amen. Good evening. And uh, welcome to our evening service tonight. <clears throat> Brother Daly, I'm going to ask, sir, if you'd open us in prayer, please. Amen. You may be seated this evening, and again, good evening. <clears throat> it's good to see you uh, tonight, and uh, as the weather seems to be turning a little cooler, it's good to have you here, and uh, glad that you are able to be here and faithful and healthy, and so still praying for those that are not able to be here. Uh, please be in prayer for some that are traveling. Um, in particular, I think of the Martinez family, and pray that uh, they would have safe travels. They were coming back from Ohio. And uh, I know that there was a few others that had been traveling uh, to visit family this week. Ms. Linda Browning, uh, the Martinez. Um, it was good to see the Traquares here this morning. Please continue to pray for them. I know that they are um, having to go back to Arkansas, the passing of her father. Um, they, the, the finality of the arrangements are taking place later this week, and so they have to go back to uh, the Little Rock, Arkansas area for that um, later this week. But anyway, pray for those. Pray for those that are um, just uh, hindered from being able to be here. And uh, uh, we'll just keep those in prayer and, and remember those, please. Uh, I did have uh, uh, one or two men talk to me about Saturday morning and the men's uh, breakfast that we're having that are planning on coming in to maybe help a little bit. Uh, you know, it, it takes, I would say, it takes a good three or four guys to get things ready, but if we had 10 guys there helping get things ready, then the more the merrier. And it's just a great time to just kind of fellowship and and uh, build each other up during that time. So the breakfast starts at 9. We'll, I'm sure we'll, I will be getting here about probably about 7.30 that morning. If you want to talk to me this evening, um, then we will uh, try to put some things together. It, it may not take that long, but just putting, kind of getting things kind of put together and organized, it'll take a little bit of a little bit of time. But the cooking of all the things won't take uh, that specifically that long. So 
anyway, somewhere between 7.30 and 8, I'm sure we'll start with the cooking process and, and get that ready to go. But, uh, men, if you are interested in, in being there and being a part of that, please let me know. Ladies, if you have any final instructions concerning your activity that's coming up this Friday and Saturday, please see Ms. Christina for any final uh, thoughts or directions there and then uh, teens if you have not already gotten one of the flyers for the teen Christmas activity that is Friday December 11th or parents of teens if you have not already gotten one of those uh, then please make sure that you are picking one up there's still a few that are out on the welcome center and then we can make some more of those as well and please know about that that starts at six o'clock next Friday evening we'll have that down in the fellowship hall <clears throat> downstairs and uh, you might spread the word. Uh, of course, I don't know with all the stipulations and everything that are, that are going on. I, I don't know. But you might spread the word about uh, the Christmas candlelight service. I say I don't know, which I do know. We're having that service. And uh, more than likely, there's going to be uh, the possibility that we're probably going to put pew divisions back in. Um, you know, kind of doing every other pew type thing. Just... Um, in uh, respect of you know the county and and the order that they're trying to that they are putting into place that begins tomorrow, but that still uh, opens is open for us to be able to you know invite. We're still, still going to have our candlelight service. There will still be room for others to come, and so you might uh, invite folks. That's a good outreach uh, kind of service opportunity uh, there to be able to out, reach out to somebody and invite them. Christmas is. You know, special time of year to a lot of people, although not everybody knows Christ as their Savior. Uh, it's still a special time and a candlelight service uh, and the meaning of that. A lot of people don't even know really the whole meaning of a candlelight service. And so it's a great opportunity to reach and to reach out to others and invite them to come. Um, a very simple service, but uh, one that's a very special service at the same time. And so I would encourage you to do that. Uh, we will, in the in the meantime, uh, we will try to make some some flyers or some handouts that you would be able to potentially hand out as well. Um, some other things about that will be coming out. I'm sure there will be a, um, some Facebook posts and, and other things that you'll be able to share at the same time. So please be aware of that and uh, make good use of that, please. Uh, we still, you know, I think about this, although all this is going on, we still have a... Uh, you know, as much as they want to mandate things to us, then we also have a mandate still to reach. We have a mandate still to spread the gospel. And throughout this time, God's mandate and, and command to us has been to do that. And so we need to be following that still, even though uh, things are the way that they are. And so we need to remember those. We need to remember to reach to those that were close by and uh, not forget about that. I, I, some of this I think some of this kind of is a stifling, almost makes us want to want to just kind of huddle down and become, you know, little hermits that uh, don't get out and don't talk to anybody. But the truth is, is we understand that the time is limited and uh, we need to be reaching with the gospel to those that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so anyway, praise the Lord for the opportunity that we have. Turn to turn to 324 and ushers, I'm going to ask you to come at the same time. And we're going to sing as they take up the offering this evening. We are going to go ahead and take the offering. And uh, we're going to sing Draw Me Near tonight. Uh, but we're, before we start singing, we're going to pray for the offering. If you have anything that you need to uh, place into the offering, you can do that at this time. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for the privilege uh, to give back um, just a portion uh, of what you have given to us. You ask us for just a portion, but you've blessed us so much. And Lord, uh, we know, you know we have the opportunity to give back to the one that is given to us. And thank you for providing for us. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for supplying the needs that we have. And I pray that you would please bless as we take this offering now. Please bless the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, 324, draw me near. Here we go. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, bless. 
blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 precious Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spin. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Well, turning your Bibles tonight, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. Revelation chapter number 18. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 18. Amen. As much as I... Uh, I know this is it's not really that lengthy of a chapter, but there is a lot that uh, I have to go through uh, this evening that I, that I have here from this chapter that would be good for us to go through. I was looking, uh, and the last time that I preached on a Sunday night in Revelation was actually Sunday night, October 4th, and uh, I couldn't believe that it's been that long, but... Uh, again, we've had a number of visiting uh, missionaries on Sunday nights and revival, and then I was gone for a few Sundays, uh, or gone for one Sunday, and then had another preacher here on another Sunday. So uh, we just have not had this on Sunday night here for a little over a month, almost two months now. Uh, but go ahead and stand with me if you would, and we're going to read chapter number 18 of the book of, Re book of Revelation. And... <clears throat> Start in verse number one. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the, mer excuse me, the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill, her to, fill to her double. 
how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall, shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth her merchandise any more, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all uh, thion wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, Alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more, no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Tonight we're going to look at this chapter number 18, God's judgment on Babylon. So let's pray and you may be seated. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. We do pray for those that are uh, physically hindered, some that are dealing with some physical ailments, and and just pray that you would uh, please be with them, help their uh, different ailments to uh, turn to health and to be uh, uh, to be healed. Lord, we pray, and I pray, Lord, for those that are, are uh, just not able to be here by way of being out of town for the holiday and the holiday weekend. I pray that you would give them safety and bring them back safely and. Lord, would you please help us, give us a better understanding of your word, give us a, an understanding of those things that you have told us are yet to come in the book of Revelation here, and uh, please guide and direct, give us something, Lord, this evening that helps us. Give us open ears, give us open hearts, I pray that you'd work in our midst tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this evening, and... Uh, <clears throat> God's judgment on Babylon. <clears throat> Here we see in Revelation chapter number 18, as it's been almost two months, I, I kind of, um, I want to 
try to recap very, very, very briefly um, because chapter number 17 and chapter number 18 really kind of go together in a certain respect. Chapter number 17 dealt with uh, also a destruction of Babylon, but really there are two Babylons that we would be looking at here in, in a sense. And so let's make sure that we kind of understand uh, what all is going on. We understand through the book of Revelation that we have been able to see that the devil definitely without question wants what is God's. He wants the same as what God has had and, and he wants to be God and he always has wanted and always will want what is God's. And we have seen that in various places in the book of Revelation. Uh, but we understand that the Antichrist steps forward in this tribulation period of time. And, and as we keep going further and further through the book of Revelation, we see it becoming more and more prevalent. How the Antichrist is pushing, how he steps out and starts to become more and more uh, of a figure. And so in chapter number 17 and chapter number 18 and even part of chapter number 19 in the book of Revelation, God has kind of taken us back and, and into another section of what is a little bit more parenthetical. In other words, again, we've said this before. There's a couple other places in the book of Revelation where he does this, where it's almost as though God kind of... Uh, not really pauses, but in a sense, if you could imagine, he kind of pauses the main line of all the things that are going on and he steps to the side and puts in parentheses these other pieces that he gives to us. Kind of the, the other parts of the pieces of, of things that are taking place. And, and so before we move on and before he finishes, he wants to show us some of these things that are behind the scenes and why he's doing what he is doing. And so we get to see that in chapter number 17 and chapter number 18, and then a little bit in chapter number 19 even. But you would remember with me that the, there's this tribulation period that's divided into two sections of three and a half years apiece. And, and so... Obviously, the first three and a half years, the beginning of that really deals with the removal of the church. Amen. I mean, we see that there in the first few chapters, even just of the book of Revelation. And uh, then we get to chapter number four and, and we see the church is not mentioned anymore. And so. But then as we walk through that, I don't want to go through all of that again, but we understand that there is a time when the Antichrist, <clears throat> a, a man, and the Antichrist will begin to step forward and really begin to, to make a push. And so in chapter 17 and chapter number 18, we really see God's judgment on Babylon or on these Babylons, you might say. You say, well, why would there be two Babylons. Well, what I mean by that is in chapter number 17, there is more of a, uh, what is represented as a religious Babylon. And then chapter number 18 that we are at at this point in time is more literally the physical Babylon. And so chapter number 17, uh, you know, I would encourage you to go back and to, to re-listen to that and to reference that. But uh, <clears throat> the first, this first Babylon that we would talk about in chapter number 17 would be a, uh, really a religious system that would be there and that would exist. And so those that even give allegiance to the Antichrist... Okay, and so we, we did a lot of uh, description concerning... Uh, that religious Babylon in chapter number 17. And, and so I'm just talking about it. religiously. It's this, it's the ungodly system of just spiritual wickedness and, and deception that will be in place during that time. Okay. And, and so even denominations that maybe many would call, you know, mainline denominations will kind of uh, step out. And that, that used to be true to, to a lot of fundamentals of the faith or many of them, but they will break away and, and will move into this, uh, I'm going to call it modernism that denies the scriptures and denies the Bible and what the Bible says. And so even when we were talking about chapter number 17 and considering chapter number 17, we, we referenced back to Genesis chapter number 11 when uh, the Tower of Babel was being uh, constructed and Nimrod, who was the leader of that, 
And we would know that and recall that God had to take that and destroy the Tower of Babel. And he, and he confounded the language and he, and he scattered. Really, the people scattered to all kinds of different places across the earth at that time. But when that, when that happened, it also took and spread uh, that false religion all across the earth. And so in the end here, as we considered that in chapter number 17, when all that spiritual deception then comes together, they start putting away whatever differences there would be and, and whatever, uh, you know, divides, maybe you would say there would be between religions and, and, and denominations. And they would put aside those things and come together as one kind of massive movement. All right, a, a religious side, a religious Babylon. And spiritually, you know, it, it's very sad, very sad situation. Spiritually, they believe that they, are, that they are worshiping God. But the truth is, is that they're really worshiping uh, the devil and, or this Antichrist. They're really moving in that way. He's using them uh, to, uh, to attract and bring in and kind of charismatically, he's, he's attracting them and bringing them in. And then uh, there at the end of chapter number 17, that is just destroyed. The Antichrist destroys it and that system, it's brought to an end, but it is done, uh, it, it is God's doing. Even we were recognized there at the end of chapter number 17. So uh, I'm just trying to kind of, recap briefly there of chapter number 17. Then we get to chapter eight, number 18, and we see this more, the physical Babylon. The, the actual physical uh, Babylon, the, the actual place where things have taken place and, and all this wickedness has been, this, been centered upon this Babylon. And so, we're talking about the, the destruction of this physical Babylon. We're talking about the actual, uh, the physical, you might say, headquarters, the, the, the commerce and, and the government uh, about the, the Antichrist and of the Antichrist that he will use. And so, but all indications would be that in chapter number 18, we're, very, we're talking about a specific city. We're talking about a specific place, a specific city that is there. And, uh, you know, if you look at, many would believe, if you look at modern day Iraq, that's where most would believe that Babylon is located. And, uh, you know, I don't know. We don't really know if, it, if, it, if that exact city is what is being referenced or if it's, you know, there's a lot of indications that it is going to be rebuilt before it is destroyed. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> it, it could be that. It could be a new city that is referenced as the new Babylon. Somebody talk, some people reference this as the new Babylon or the destruction of the new Babylon. Because there is an understanding that Babylon uh, will need to be uh, built or, or rebuilt. And so... Some would even indicate uh, that Babylon would be the ancient city of Rome. But that during the tribulation, it becomes the headquarters for the Antichrist and that he then would rename it as, as that Babylon. And so there's, there are certain thoughts and, and, and beliefs out there. And I'm going to read this to you. Uh, this is a, a quote from uh, Warren Wiersbe in his book. Uh, Babylon was not only an ancient city, and a powerful empire, but also the symbol of mankind's rebellion against God. In Revelation 18, Babylon represents the world system of the beast, particularly in its economic and political aspects. At the same time, John, uh, the writer of Revelation here, calls Babylon a city at least eight times. Old Testament prophecy seems to make clear that the city itself will not be rebuilt. Some equate Babylon with Rome, particularly since the harlot and the beast cooperate during the first half of, of the tribulation. And uh, so actually, again, back in chapter number 17, we made reference to uh, the very strong ties to the Roman Catholicism. Not to say that it is completely 100% that, but there is a lot of strong indications and ties that would uh, possibly show that direction. And, and so, boy, you just think about it. Think about the amount of wealth that is in the Middle East with the oil and the minerals and, and everything that is involved over there. 
uh, as we read chapter number 18 and we reread the descriptiveness of the merchandise and the, everything that is going on and the, the wealth that is there, there is a, there, it, there's no doubt that it, it very well could easily be uh, right there in the Middle East. And so now all I'm saying is, is there is a, this is the fall or the destruction of that physical Babylon. And so let's, let's kind of get into this chapter and uh, kind of nail this down a little bit of what is going on. So in verses one through three, we see this, this the declaration of this angel. There's the declaration of the angel. And we see the arrival of the angel in verse number one. After, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So here's another angel speaking of a different one than from chapter number 17. And you would also recognize at the very beginning of the verse, he says, and after these things, we've uh, made mention of that phrase in the book of Revelation before. And understood that that is a, a phrase that indicates a change of, of focus, really of a, a new vision that is coming that John is, that John is able to see here. He says, after these things, uh, now there's a new beginning. I, I'm seeing a new vision. I'm seeing a new, uh, I have a new focus on things. Another angel came down from heaven. What does it say? He says, have great power with the earth and the earth was lightened with his glory. So here's this mighty angel and it says, describing him as having great power, an angel that is given even a position of, of greatness in heaven. We've said that before as well. We understand that there's maybe we would, we would kind of understand a, 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 a hierarchy or a, 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 a position type of level of different angels that are there in heaven and, and this one is of great uh, power. This, has a, this angel in particular has a lot of, uh, of greatness and he comes and he makes this announcement in verse number two, he says he cried mightily with a strong voice. Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So he, he announces, there's this announcement of the reason for Babylon's destruction. And to a certain degree, we would understand, we, we kind of understand and know why it would be destroyed. It, is, it has been the beginning and really the center part of the beginning of false religion and wickedness all through the Bible and all through until the very end of times. It has been a, a center, central part of that. And so uh, we see these, these reasons. There's a couple of reasons he gives. Number one is that Babylon was a stronghold for evil and for wicked spirits and devils and demons and, and all of those things. He, he lists it right there. He says, it's fallen and become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And we understand this is concerning what, he's, what is being announced here by this angel is concerning the end times. And we know without question that there are spiritual powers in play. Amen. There are definitely spiritual powers that are taking place and that are in place here. But, you know, I, I believe I'll, I'll say this. Listen, even in a service that we're having like right now, there are spiritual aspects. There are spiritual powers in play right now. Right. Uh, I mean, we've talked about uh, the spiritual warfare that is going on and, and and that happens day in and day out. And I've made reference to it's it's probably a good thing that we can't see that it would probably scare us literally to death if we could. But you would recognize with me that there is a spiritual war and spiritual warfare that's taking place. Listen, even tonight, even as we sit and stand here in this service tonight, there is a spiritual warfare taking place in the hearts of each and every one of us. And, and, and we, it ought not be a mystery to us that that is, that that is there. I mean, we believe that the Holy Spirit comes and meets with us as we come together, do we not? <clears throat> So we, we consider that side of things and we know that that spiritual uh, side of things is taking place. 
And we know as the word of God is, is being preached that the Holy Spirit of God is, is doing a work in the hearts and in the lives of, of each individual or uh, in particular individuals that would be here. Praise the Lord this morning for the, the one young man that, that got saved this morning and the Holy Spirit was uh, working there. And he, he was talking to me afterward. He said, boy, I, just, I was just feeling a, a pull. I'm just really feeling a pull that I needed to, to come and, and I needed to come, come up front and, and take care of some things. And so I praise the Lord for that. He got saved. Amen. I mean, praise the Lord for that truth. And, and we ought to be rejoicing anytime something like that takes place. But you understand as much as the Holy Spirit is here meeting with us, there is a spiritual warfare that is taking place in and amongst as we're here. We ought not be foolish enough to think that there is not potentially in this service, we might say demons that are trying to disrupt people from listening. I mean, would we not be foolish to not think that? We know very plainly, very, very easily we know When's a baby going to cry? Oh, you're a horrible pastor. I can't believe you're calling a baby a, a little demon or a little devil. Well, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I wouldn't say that out loud, at least. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, but I'm not, I'm seriously, I'm not saying that they are. But you would recognize with me that we could be a tool We can be a tool that the devil will use to distract. Listen, all you young people. We can be a tool that the devil can use. In the, you can be a tool in the life of someone to help them not to listen. You can be a tool. I'm just talking about through the service. And, and, and Go ahead in the service. Go ahead and talk through it all. Send a text through it all. Those little pieces are, are, are pieces that are tools used to disrupt the service and disrupt the spiritual uh, workings that the Holy Spirit wants to do in somebody's life. Listen, uh, there's, there's reasons why we try to keep uh, the disruptions down. I understand there's going to be things. I mean, life is life, right? I, I mean, a baby cries, but it is, is it not amazing that a baby's going to cry at the invitation time? That a phone's going to ring at the invitation time. That, listen, some, something's going to happen, uh, you know, that's going to be during that, that real impactful time for somebody. God's getting a hold of somebody's heart. God's trying to do something. He's, he's trying to mold their heart. And maybe he's got a grip on their heart. And he's wanting them to come. He's wanting them to make a decision. He's wanting them to make a decision for him. And what happens? There's a, there's a disruption out in the foyer. An argument or, 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 or somebody, uh, whatever it may be, somebody falls, somebody, uh, somebody is out there making dis distractions. I'm just saying, listen, uh, that is a tool that is used by the devil. It's used uh, to, to work against the heart of people that God is trying to get a hold of their heart. And, and as much as uh, that sounds... <laughs> Much as that sounds bad and we don't like to hear that kind of stuff in our politically correct day and age. Listen, I'm just simply saying you can be a tool. You may not be a devil. You might be, but you may not be a devil, but you can be a tool used by the devil. I'm not so sure, but that there haven't been a few that maybe. <laughs> maybe they've been more than the tool used by the devil at times. If we're not careful, we can disrupt what God is doing. But you understand with me, there's a spiritual dimension. Amen? There's a spiritual dimension. And, and so, 
we've got to be aware of, the, of that type of thing. And, and we see here as this, as this angel makes this announcement and he, and, he, and he cries and saying, listen, here's the reason the, the, the destruction has come is because they've become a habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and, and, and hateful bird. And uh, we can go back in Revelation chapter number nine when we're speaking of the, the fifth and the sixth judgments uh, back then in, in chapter number nine, the evil spirits were being loosed upon the earth is what it said. They were being loosed upon the earth. And so then we get to verse number three and he gives the second reason for their destruction. He says, for all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. There's really not a nation or not a people that haven't been sucked in and into this wicked and evil empire. <clears throat> so we have this mass movement at this point in time of these, of these people that have been uh, kind of sucked in, if I can put it that way, and, and they, they've banded together and they're following this wicked leader. And, and, and remember, there's gonna be this, there's gonna be a mark that's going to be given. Right? I mean, we've talked about it. We talked about the mark of the beast that'll be handed out and, and nobody's going to be able to buy or sell except they receive the mark and it's going to be a sign of their allegiance really to this dictator or this dictatorship that's going to be in place. And, and so the, that, the Bible likens that relationship of, of this city here in verse number three of Babylon uh, and its wicked leaders as immorality. Fornication, spiritual adultery. It likens it to immorality. And, and by the way, uh, there's, a, there's a correlation there. Whenever there is a, a de demonic activity and a moving uh, away from God, there are things that will parallel that type of things. And one of those things is immorality. When people, when a nation, when a people as a whole, when they will move away from God, Immorality is an indicator of that. <clears throat> That's why for years people have been praying for this nation and understanding and seeing the, the, move, uh, the movement in that direction, immorally speaking. And, and uh, you know, as a gauge, it's not the only gauge that can be used, but it is a gauge that can be seen. We can see it even just in TV programming. Right? You take, a, you take a cross section of TV programming in the last, throw it out, whatever, 20 years. You could go back and say 50 years, but even if you did the last 20 years. <clears throat> and things are consistently being adjusted and tweaked and moved. And, and uh, you know, they've got a whole rating system out there for programs and for movies and everything. And I'm telling you right now, the rating system that was there when I was a kid is not the same rating system that's there now. The same terminology of the rating system, is, it may be there, you know, whether it's PG or G or PG or PG-13 and R and, and all that. Listen, that, that same rating letter system may still be there, but what I'm saying is, is what is allowed under each one of those rating systems has changed. No question that it has changed. And so you understand, uh, it's no wonder when we look at our nation and we see this, this movement of, of, of uh, gender equality and the, the mystery of, well, what gender is this little child? You know, my initial answer to that is as much as God made salvation simple, God made gender pretty simple. And, I, you know, there's no need to be crude about it. There's no need to be inappropriate about it. I mean, we were home for Thanksgiving. We went to uh, uh, Christina's family's house for Thanksgiving the other day and, and uh, helped my father-in-law go look for uh, the cattle that he's got. And he couldn't find a, a cow. And, it, and so we went out to go find it. And it, would, it had gone across the creek. And uh, the day before, it was... The cow was by itself, and the day that we went and found it, the cow had a new calf. 
And so it was off by herself and the calf was feeding on her. And, and you know, I'm just, I'm just very simply stating, it doesn't take much to know. We didn't walk up there and go, hmm, I wonder what that calf wants to be. It's not natural, folks. All this movement toward gender, uh, gender, this gender mystery and, and decision and uh, oh, they don't accept what they are and this non-acceptance. And listen, I'm just saying it's not natural. But that kind of move in society, that kind of movement, that direction is a society, is an indication of the society that they have stepped away from God and they've stepped away from those fixed points of reference that God has given to us. Let's keep going on. Verse number four. We see it from verse four to verse seven, the degradation of Babylon. And, And we see it, verse four, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, speaking of Babylon, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities, re- reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, and the cup which she hath filled, fill her, fill to her double, how much she hath glorified herself. You might notice how puffed up and how, uh, you know, just amazing it was bragged about Babylon here it says and lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her give it to her they're saying for she saith in her heart I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow she's very confident very puffed up very haughty but there's a call for separation in verse number four And so we see, it says actually in verse number four, I heard another voice. So here's another voice separate of the angel that we see in verse number one. But he says, I heard another voice and uh, talking from this system and talking about this uh, system of Babylon and its coming destruction. It's amazing uh, how it's still mentioning this here. It says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Remember, God is taking us and kind of stepping to the side and talking about things that are going on and the reasoning behind some of the destruction that he is bringing and this parenthetical time. And so uh, don't, don't let that really kind of throw you off. We understand that people are going to be saved during the tribulation period. We've talked about that before and, and looked at that through in some of the previous chapters of the book of Revelation, but people will be saved during the tribulation period. But some of them, truthfully, as we can see here, will be living in this Babylon, in this, maybe it's the new Babylon, but they will be living in this Babylon and, and its system. And God is simply coming to them and saying, hey, be careful. You need to separate from this system. Don't get caught up in it. Don't get stuck in it. Don't take the mark of the beast and and don't get caught here where where it will lead to destruction. Now, as we consider that, some would say, well, how would they be alive? If they didn't receive the mark of the beast and and we understand that in order to be able to buy and sell anything, people are going to have to have received the mark of the beast. So how are they still, how could they be alive? And we do understand, the Bible tells us that many of them are, are or are going to be martyrs. Many of them are martyrs already, and the Bible tells us that, but if they don't take the mark, how are they going to exist? And to be honest with you, uh, the Bible doesn't specifically tell us. It's, uh, you know, it would, it's kind of my framing up of this, and so I want to make sure that we understand that, but... <laughs> I mean, if they can't buy or sell at a, at a just straightforward uh, market per se, will there not be the potential to have a, maybe there's a black market of some sort. Trading going on and, and some things that are being done uh, kind of in a, in a black market type of uh, system possibly. I'm just talking about maybe a, a networking of those few believers that are still remaining and, and what they are able to get and how they're able to do it. And I'm just, I, I don't really know. 
but there are definitely those that will receive Christ during the tribulation period of time that, that apparently may still be uh, alive. As he's saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. <clears throat> so God is still calling here to this, the nation of Israel and even to these final days to be careful about what they do. He's saying he's going to do something about it. Kind of makes me think of, again, back in the book of Genesis. It's incredible the, the connections that the first book of the Bible have with the last book of the Bible. But in Genesis chapter number 19, you can think of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And what, he, what, what happened? They had to get Lot and Lot, they had to drag Lot out of there before that destruction came. Before he judged those cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so I've already read it, but we see the consequences in verses five, six, and seven. And God just says, listen, I'm done. I've extended mercy. I've extended my grace long enough. And now judgment is coming. Judgment is going to take place. And we see it in verse number eight. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So we see the destruction of Babylon here in verse number eight. Now remember, just to still kind of frame this, we're, still, we're talking about the vile judgments Okay, we're still in the, the vile judgments, right? So we had the, the seal judgments, and then we had the trumpet judgments, and then we had the vile judgments. And we're at the, very, we're, we're at the very end of the vile judgments here, but that's what we are talking about. And in this parenthetical period of time, the idea of being that as these judgments fall out, these vile judgments, this is one of the judgments or, or a part of one of the judgments. That Babylon will be destroyed. It'll fall out. This judgment will fall out on Babylon herself. And so the plagues come, the pain, uh, this pain is instant. The, the destruction is instant, we can see. But notice here, and we're gonna kind of finish out, the last part of this chapter goes uh, <clears throat> fairly quickly here. But you notice here from verses nine all the way down to verse number 19, the lament that takes place the lament of Babylon. And so verse number nine through 19, we see the rulers that lament in verse number nine and 10. It says the kings of the earth who've committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city for in one hour is thy judgment come. You know, there's lament here that we can see first from the rulers, as it mentions the kings who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. But there is no lamentation because they brought it on themselves. There's no repentance of, oh, my goodness. And look at what we have done. Look at how we have fallen away and how we've gotten away from God. It has nothing to do with that. It all has to do with uh, the city and the destruction of the city and now their inability to do in the future what they have been doing. This, this lusciousness of life and this, this just <clears throat> rampant sin and immorality, uh, spiritually speaking. And, and so, but again, we see the, really the, an, an, an indication of the depravity of man. When man will not take responsibility for his actions. When man will not take uh, responsibility and there's an unwillingness to be responsible for what I've done. I would say we can see that today. Not willing to own up for what I've done, not willing to, to, uh, to, to come and, and just be open and admit what I have done, what I have failed, where I have failed and the sin that I have done. 
It's a moving away from God. And listen, uh, when we fall into that trap, it, it begins with our inability to come and humble ourselves before God and come before God and say, God, I have done this. I have sinned. We need that short account with God. We need that time that we come to God and say, God, this is where I have fallen. But when we don't have an ability, listen, hey, as society wants to teach, oh, I'm not, I'm not accepting that. Somebody else should have done this. Somebody else uh, did this, which led to me doing this. And it couldn't have been my fault. Listen, don't fall into that. It's a play of the devil and a movement away from God. Listen, we have to own up to what we are and what we have done and what we uh, need, that we need help and that we can't do it on our own. We need a humility of heart that takes place. But the depravity of man is indicated by when man has an unwillingness to take responsibility. Listen, young people, start now. Take responsibility now. Take responsibility in your, in your work. Take responsibility in your home. Take responsibility in what your parents are asking you to do. Take responsibility in the mistakes that you make. Be willing to admit it. Don't be so full of pride. Don't be so full of yourself that you can't come to yourself and you can't go to somebody and apologize for something that you have done. Not just young people. People my age, people older than me. We must have an ability to take responsibility for what we have done. And so we go on, we see all the way from chapter, verse number 11 down to verse number 16. It, it talks about the merchants. The merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And that's the reason they, they lament. It has nothing to do with their responsibility. It has nothing to do what, with their wickedness and them moving away from God and not acknowledging God in their life and not ever acknowledging God, but it has to do with their inability to live the lavishness and the, the luxury and the economy and the commerce of life that they have always known just because of the destruction of Babylon. They lose their ability to go to market and their trade is destroyed. And, and let me just read you uh, just in brief a couple of verses. You understand, this is, you see where this is all kind of now hinging upon financial things, money and, and all the trade and all the, the gold. And boy, he goes through a, a very long and strong list from verse 12 verse, down through verse number 14 of the things that they will no longer be able to have. He lists gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and thyme wood and manner of vessels of ivory and most precious wood and we can keep going down. 2 Timothy chapter number 6, verse 17 says this, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Listen, God, God gave the uh, opportunity for, for some people in particular to, to have some wealth, to maybe even be uh, considered rich in this world. But he, in, he instructs them, if you're going to have that privilege that I have given you, because it is from him that they have that. He said, if you have that privilege, I don't want you to trust in those riches. I don't want you to live your life in trusting of those riches, but instead, as he gives certain people riches, he gives it to them to do good with them, to be a blessing with them. Maybe you'd understand with me that what we give back to God and what we give to God is never lost. It's never lost. It's never uh, just thrown down the chute and, and thrown away. It's never lost in the garbage. Instead, it, it always used, it's always used by God for his purpose and for his doing. 
James chapter number five, verse one, go to now ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, they crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. So we, I'm just giving you a couple of verses concerning uh, those that ha would have riches and instruction of those that are treating them right or instruction of how they should treat them right and then those that did not treat them right and what will happen. But we see the merchants here crying for that loss of that, of that economy, that loss of their sales and that loss of their merchandise to be able to trade and to, to make money upon. But then you also see it from the shippers in verse number 17, 18, and 19. One hour, so great riches come to not and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, as many as trade by sea, stood afar off. I mean, this was a major destruction. And they're all looking at it, as it says in verse 17, in one hour, so great riches has come to naught. And they're all looking at it in amazement. Verse 20 through 24 through the end of the chapter, we see really the desolation. But you'll notice in verse number 20, the heavens rejoice. It says verse 20, rejoice over her, thou heaven and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And amazing, you think about it, there's weeping on earth, but there's rejoicing in heaven. Think about this, Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Those that were martyred. Those that ended up giving their life for their service for the Lord and, and for trusting the Lord and, and wondering, when's the Lord going to take care of them for, for avenging our blood? Here it is. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Listen, there's a rejoicing here, not because we would ever rejoice in death, in the death of somebody, in the death of a multitude of people. But there's a rejoicing, listen, in the righteousness of God. At this point in time, God has extended his grace and his mercy to extents that truthfully I myself am absolutely amazed at. You consider all that we've already walked through in the book of Revelation, and God has continually given another chance. He's still, he's still putting it out there. He's still waiting, and he's still giving him more time, and he's still in all this time. And now we get to this place. Listen, the rejoicing is in his righteousness. He is righteous. He has abundantly extended his grace and mercy. And it's not been taken. And the destruction of Babylon comes. They have had their opportunity. And so through verse 21 and verse 22, this, this angel demonstrates the spoil. The angel comes and he, he uses this millstone as an example and as an example that the destruction will be violent and it will, it will be total, just like throwing a millstone in the sea and it just sinks, boom, right to the bottom. It'll happen. And 
But there's total and complete destruction that's emphasized in verse 22, verse 23, and verse 24. And so as we finish at verse, or chapter number 18 here, you'd understand with me that now as we move into these last few chapters that God has given to us in the book of Revelation, we're really moving out of this last parenthetical time that God has kind of separated us out. And we're moving into these final moments that really God is going to complete his work. The completion of it all is going to come. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes this evening. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless, Lord, in this invitation time. And, and, uh, you know, there's a lot here in chapter number 18 concerning Babylon. But as we can see spiritual truths that would apply even to us. Spiritual truths of how... The spiritual warfare is real and and it's it's taking place and it's it's happening day in and day out. And how we could be, if not careful, used as a tool of the devil to distract, to keep someone from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, to, to hinder somebody from growing in their spiritual life. God, I pray that you would please... Uh, bless now in this invitation time and help us, God, to respond. Thank you for working in our midst. Even this morning with this young man that got saved this morning, I thank you for uh, working and in, in moving in, in his heart this morning. Thank you so much for that. Lord, I pray that you'd bless now as we have this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this evening? And maybe it's just as simple as this tonight. God, help me. Help me not to lose track of where where I am. Help me not to get off course in thinking that uh, I'm doing just fine. But I get so involved with the things of this world and the, the, the money of this world and the lifestyle of this world that I lose track of who you are and I lose track of my service to you.